our worship service here at Satellite Beach. But Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's been a blessing to us, and we will be a blessing to everyone that we meet. And we wanted to start our service with this announcement. We have a special member of our group today that's had a birthday today. We just want to wish Dwight a happy birthday. <laughs> One year younger. Are we singing happy birthday? If we... It's a joy in the house of the Lord. We would want to go ahead and invite you, if you would, join us to stand as we do our call to worship. And thank you all for being here, as well as those that are watching via internet. We find rest for all. <coughs> Soul and God alone. Who is our rock and our fortress? Our, our salvation and honor depend, depend on God. May we trust in Him at all times. Amen. Let's praise God.
Amen. And you may be seated and welcome on this last Sunday of the month. If you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. Thank you for doing that. If you could write 9 o'clock at the top, that would help. So <clears throat> the people who had entered it in, thank you. Our prayer focus this week is the Middle East and all that's going on there. Just keep that situation that it comes under control and not explodes and expands into something more horrific than it is right now. So just pray for the people. We have people over there, <clears throat> citizens, embassy people, and other people. So just keep it, keep it in your prayers. Uh, today, right after this service, we have coffee with the pastor. If anybody's interested in information about the church, interested in joining the church, we'll meet about 10, 15, 10, 10, somewhere over there. Just stand by the door. It says office, and we'll find you, and we'll go into my office, and we can talk. <clears throat> and then on February 11th, we have our marriage covenant renewal service. We've got a few people who have already given us their stuff, so we'll have a lot of fun. So if you've been married for uh, a multiple of five, five, 10, 20, 30, 35, any of that, you're eligible to participate. And then anybody 50 years and older can participate. We just need you to let us know <clears throat> and have a photo when you were married and today's photo. Our Ash Wednesday service is going to be on Valentine's Day. The two come together this year. It's uh, February 14th, and we're going to do it at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. So you can come here and uh, see worship your greatest valentine you ever had which is jesus christ and as he prepares to do the greatest act of love for you so um we'll do that on the february 14th and we still have some giving statements back there we're going to mail those monday uh in a few envelopes if you haven't picked them up thank you i think i've looked through there and we've given pretty much everyone that's out there but um they're back there and we're still looking for nomad jobs frank where there he is um still if you know somebody a neighbor anybody that does work Oh, we got another group of nomads coming in in a couple weeks. Four weeks. Yep, and then we'll be done. So they've been doing some good work. Well, with that, then let us stand and greet one another, wave and say hi. Hello, guys. Hello, everyone. See 
We stand in awe just to call your name, Jesus. For you're there for us always, providing for us, take care of us, making sure that we have everything that we need. We come this morning to magnify your name because you're worthy to be praised. There's none above you. There's none like you. Jesus came and sacrificed his life so that we may have life and opportunity for eternal life. Without you, we are nothing. We have nothing. We could do nothing. 
Well, so we just want to praise you and magnify you more and more each time we come into this service. We may have come with some heavy hearts, some heavy burdens, but still we praise your name. We may come with things that may not be going well, but we praise your name. When things are going well, we magnify your name because only you are worthy to be praised. So for all the blessings that we will be afforded to have this morning, we want to ask that our spirit allow us to take this same pleasant feeling to those around us. May each family member represented here today receive a blessing that they can carry to their families. And we pray for them, Lord, that as we go through this, this, this life that we have here, sometimes it may not be what we expect, but we know you're there with us always. So kind Heavenly Father, may we enjoy this service, this moment, as we worship you together in beauty and holiness of your love. This is our humble prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. be seated. Let us pray. O God of grace and peace and joy, God who loves beyond measure, 
God who accepts us and presents us with a wonderful future. We come this morning to present ourselves to you in praise and worship because we've come to empty ourselves, Lord, of all the stuff that holds us down so that we might be filled with your glory, your grace, your hope, your love. That we might be so filled that it overflows from us that as we leave this place, it just pours out to those we meet. Because, Lord, we want to be used by you as those sharing your love. We want to be your messengers of hope your messengers of love. So Lord, fill us this day so that we meet, might leave this place filled and renewed, ready to love our neighbor. And Lord, as we come here this morning, we lift up all that's going on in the Middle East. Lord, the anger is high there, the tension is high, the hatred is high. But you, Lord, are the one who can bring peace. You are the one who can change even cold stone hearts. And so, Lord, we especially lift up the leaders of all the countries there. The ones that are pushing the buttons. Lord, touch them. Reveal yourself to them. Give them dreams of your ways, of your hope. Because, Lord, nothing as good as coming from the hatred and the pain and the suffering and the killing. So bring peace to that area, Lord, because we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, Lord, we also come here remembering those in our midst who are hurting, who need your healing, your strength. We lift up all of those that are on our prayer list, Lord. You know their needs. Be with them. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request, that is silent in our heart that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we continue to lift up this congregation, its purpose, its ministry, its vision for this year. And Lord, we're already a month into the year. And we seek your guidance as we seek to improve our invitation to our neighbors as we seek to improve our own discipleship, our own walking closer with you, Lord. Help us this year to walk closer with you, to be better about inviting our neighbor, of sharing your love with those we come into contact with. Help us to be your church in this community, Lord, because you have planted us here and you have brought each of us here to this place for this purpose. So fulfill your purpose in each of us here, Lord, in this time and space. Because we want to be your people, because we know, Lord, that we find the greatest joy walking with you, doing your will, serving you. Because, Lord, we want to be where you are, working where you are, and loving the people you love. So fill us with that vision. Fill us with that purpose. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we might go and be and do. Because, Lord, we know you want the best for us. And you know you have purpose for us, both individually and collectively, and share that vision with us. Let us see what you have for us to do. Help us, Lord, to be your church. And we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ who allows us to be your church, who's given us the power to be your church, who's forgiven us so that we might go out and be your church and forgive others. We thank you for all that Jesus Christ did for us, including dying on the cross for our sins and rising to offer us eternal life. And we close now the prayer in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors over there to the room on the right, and they'll return at the end of the service. And we'll continue in song.
to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. come to that time where we lift up our tithes and offerings. And next Sunday, we are going to go back to the old way of doing it and passing the plate. So when you come in, you won't see the baskets there. Just hold your offering until we pass it, which is the way we used to do it and kind of get back to that. And we'll hopefully, um, Mark will be recruiting people to help pass the plate or the basket, depending on whether we're using a plate or a basket. We, <laughs> we have both back there. Um, but the newsletter, which will be coming out here shortly, I think I mentioned this last week, uh, my article will talk about all the money that we kind of gave to outside organizations to help people. And I went back and I looked at the last three years, and each year we've increased in our giving to outside the church, and that's a wonderful thing. And so I thank you for that. And I also thank you that you're still, those are still contributing money to pay our mortgage on the renovations we did to the Fellowship Hall Community Outreach Center. We've still got a few more years to go on that. Um, but y'all are thankfully contributing enough. We've got about 11 and a half months worth of mortgage payments sitting in the bank in case there's another crazy thing that happens in the world. We know we can make our, <clears throat> those payments for a while. Um, Shirley's been very good at managing that. She discovered that they changed the principal to do the interest the day it's received. So instead of waiting to the end of the month to pay it, she pays it the first of the month because we're really not earning interest on the money sitting in the bank. So we earn interest on the money by reducing the interest on the mortgage. So uh, Shirley's just that way. She finds ways to save us money. So she's a blessing. Well, as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, your peace, your hope. We thank you that you bless us in so many ways, that you give us talents and gifts to come to serve you, not only in the church, but into the community. You give us talents to go and make a living. You just bless us and bless us and bless us, and we thank you for all those blessings, Lord. And now as we come to return just a portion of that blessing in the form of these, our tithes and offerings, Lord, receive them, multiply them, and guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from that book that every child learns in Sunday school. (laughs) 
The book of Jonah, the third chapter, beginning the first verse through five and then skipping up to verse 10. Hear now these words. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, Bishop Will Williman tells this amusing story about a young man named Sam. And he was quite troubled, totally irresponsible. He made many mistakes in his life, including flunking out of college, forced to find a job. He met a woman there, and he married her. And they began attending a small church, and his life was just always a struggle. He's trying to figure out what he was supposed to do. And as time went on, Sam felt a tugging at his heart as if he were called towards the ministry. And he dreaded telling his parents for whatever reason, but he finally did. And he explained that even though his life had taken an uncertain twist and turns, he now felt, he now felt that he had found his calling. And when he had finished saying this, his mother just burst into tears. She then cried, I am so ashamed. I can't believe this has happened. Well, this was not the reaction he was expecting. And he was baffled by it. He says, what do you mean? She replied, I, I can't believe this happened. Didn't I tell you that before you were born, I had a couple of miscarriages? I didn't think we would ever have a child. So I promised God that if he would let me have a baby and I could bring to term, if it were a boy, I would name him Samuel and would dedicate him to God just like Hannah did back in the Old Testament. Well, Sam was there to listen to the story. And he was floored. He said, why didn't you tell me? You could have saved me a whole lot of trouble if I'd known this story about me. And his mother said, well, we're Methodists. How was I supposed to know this would work? <laughs> I didn't even know we believed in this kind of thing. Well, too many Christians, that's how we act sometimes about the Bible. I, don't, I didn't believe this. I don't know about this. I didn't believe this actually works because we have trouble believing sometimes. And this really pertains to different passages of Scripture. And down through the ages, people have had trouble with certain aspects of Scripture, especially the miraculous things, the supernatural. Thomas Jefferson was one of those. He even went so far that after he retired, he embarked on a project that he had contemplated for years. He literally cut and pasted passages from the four Gospels into one integrated narrative of Jesus' life, but he left out every miracle and supernatural event. And in his mind, he simply had reduced the Gospels to what he called the most sublime and benevolent code of morals which has ever been offered to man. But it wasn't God. If you leave out all the miracles... All the supernatural works, we miss so much about God's love for us and who he is. And today's scripture comes from the book of Jonah. And if I had asked you to think of one thing about Jonah, I know what the number one answer would be, especially if I asked the children. He was swallowed by a whale. And even that might be wrong because what doesn't say he was swallowed by a whale, he said he was swallowed by a large fish. But it could have been a whale. We don't know because of the way the word was used. And most people who read the book focus on who Jonah is and why he did what he did. And I didn't even focus on Jonah. When I was struggled with God's call to ministry, which I felt when I was about 17 years old, and I went not till I was nearly 40, I thought of Jonah. See, when God calls you to a purpose and you run the other way, he doesn't let you go. He just keeps after you, chasing you and chasing you. He will not let the calling go until you finally say, okay, God, you either surrender or you live a miserable life. 
And what's interesting about Jonah, and even what I did, is when God calls you to a certain place, you run in the opposite direction expecting that God won't be there. That's how dumb we are sometimes. We think we can escape God by going somewhere where he isn't, and he won't find us. But God got Jonah's attention, and he finally went to announce to the Ninevites that God was going to destroy the city. You remember the story? God said, go to speak to the Ninevites. And Jonah said, no, I hate those people. They're mean, nasty people. You're going to forgive them. And he's headed the other directions. And I think the Ninevites teach us a wonderful lesson about God. The Ninevites were part of the Assyrian Empire for a good portion of their lives. And it was in this time that we believe that the Assyrians were in control of the area. And Nineveh, which is today called Mosul, is one of the oldest Assyrian cities with the original city starting in 6,000 B.C. and it had inhabited people there since 6,000 B.C. And as I said at the time of Jonah, most believe the Assyrians inhabited and they were not nice people, especially the Jews. They were cruel So it's no wonder that Jonah didn't want to go there. He said, they'd probably kill me if I went there. And even states why he didn't want to go. He wanted the people killed, not saved. And we read this in in Jonah 4, 2, which says, he prayed to the Lord after God had forgiven them. Oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He said, I knew you would be too good to destroy him. So I didn't want to give him the chance. And that's the part of the story I would like to focus on, the Ninevites and their response to hearing God's word and the change in them. See, it's easy to see why Jonah didn't want to go. Their people were cruel. He probably feared what we'd do to him. And the same reaction was when, happened when a man named uh, Ananias got a call from God and said, there's this guy named Saul. I blinded him. I want you to go to his house, lay hands on him so he can receive sight. If you remember the story, Ananias comes to God and says, are you crazy, God? Don't you know who that guy Saul is? He's killing people like me. He has orders to arrest people like me. And you want me to go give him sight? And God says, yes. And he went. We have a hesitancy to look at people and use our eyes to see them instead of seeing the wonder that God has for them. And here we get one of the great miracles of God because it takes a supernatural thing to accept one who hates you and look for the good in that person and see and give them an opportunity for change. And this is how God operates, is God does not let our past determine our future. He was not going to let the past of the Ninevites determine the future of the Ninevites. He was going to give them a chance to grow, to change. And God is constantly calling us to him so that we might be transformed into a new creation and find a new and wonderful life. And sometimes that we who are afraid to share his view of the world because we have people we want God to zap instead of blessing. But to do this, we've got to change how we look at the world. I think I've shared this story before in his book, The Trivialization of God, Donald McCullen quotes Freeman Patterson. He's a Canadian photographer who was describing the barriers that prevented him from seeing the best photo possibilities. Patterson said, letting go of the self is an essential precondition to real seeing. When you let go of yourself, you abandon any preconceptions about the subject matter which might cramp you into photography, photographing in a certain predetermined way. When you let go, new conceptions arise from your direct experience of the subject matter, and new ideas and feelings will guide you as you make pictures. And what Donald McClellan was saying is in the spiritual life, just as in photographers, seeing the world through our eyes and not God's eyes is the greatest barrier to seeing great possibilities in people, to seeing the change that God offers people. See, we need to remember that God desires all to come to know his love and to be changed by it. And so God is always looking at our future and not our past. He's looking at everybody's future. He's constantly calling us to repent of our bad past and to turn towards him. 
And repent is, is basically a word meaning turn around and go the opposite direction. And that's not returning to our past ways. It's returning from our present bad ways and going in a new direction. See, too often in the church, we want to go back to the old ways when trouble comes, when we see things going wrong. This was the problem the Israelites had in Egypt. When it got hard, when it got frustrating, when it got difficult, what do they tell Moses? Let's go back to Egypt and be slaves. Because we knew it. When the disciples were struggling with Christ's resurrection, they had seen him, they would heard it, they were all confused in their mind. What did they do? They went back to fishing. We have a habit to go back to old ways instead of turning around and returning to God and his ways. That's what repenting is, is turning around and seeking God. Now, we can find solace in the past, but that is not the future. And this is a problem that our church really needs to look at, not just our church, the denomination, the big church, is we too often, and I've heard it for 25 years, because we've been struggling with attendance and ministry for 30, 40 years now, is I hear all the stories of what the church used to do and there's a longing to go back to that church and we can't go back to that church because that was a different time and culture. We are to minister in a new time and culture. The same message, but a new delivery mechanism. That's what the church has always done. It has adapted its way it proclaims the good news. And that's what we need to be about if we want people to see that there is new possibilities in their life. I love what famed UCLA basketball coach John Wooden once told his players. He said, don't live in the past. You can't do anything about the past. It will never change whether it's yesterday or last year. The future is yet to be determined and can be influenced by what you do today. Today is the only day that really matters. Your past can't be changed, but you can change. Even the consequences of past choices, choices can be used for the glory of God when you ask him to transform your mind and heart. In fact, your difficult past may be a very tool that God uses to encourage others to not to walk in the same pain you did. And this is what the Ninevites did. They recognized where they were. And it was not where they wanted to be. And so they repented and began a process of turning to God. And that's what repentance is. It's a process of turning to God, of to praying, of seeking him, studying I love what a man named John Long, John James Long said. He said, one reason God created time was so there'd be a place to bury the failures of the past. It was in the past, but not the future. And God gives us a way forward through forgiveness with repentance. And repentance isn't just saying empty words, but a change in who we are and where we want to go. And our part in this is to help people by investing in people we meet. And that's tough because there's people out there who don't like us. There's people out there who've hurt us. But God still calls us to go and to speak to them a words of love. And so we invest by getting to know our neighbor, to pray for those we see. We don't worry about if someone will respond to our actions or not. That's not our responsibilities. Ours is to go and to plant seeds, to water seeds. It is God's responsibility for the growth. This is what Paul told the Corinthians when they were divided about who to follow. Some were saying, if I follow Paul, as others were saying, I follow Paulus. Some were saying, I follow Christ, and others, all sorts of things. And Paul wrote this. He said, what, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his a task, I planted the seed, Apollo watered it, but God made it grow. See, our task is to go and to share, to plant seeds, to water seeds, to encourage people and leave it up to God to make it grow. I think I shared this story some years back. It's a wonderful story that illustrates how we go out there not worrying about the success of what we do or not, but the impact it will have if we do go. Gene Giano tells this story of Elzier Bouffier. He's a shepherd he met in 1913 in the French Alps. And at the time, because of careless deforestation and the mountains around 
Provence, France were barren. Former villages were deserted because the springs and brooks had run dry. And he said the winds blew furiously, unimpeded by any foliage there. And he said while he was mountain climbing, Giano came across this shepherd and he invited in for the night. And after did, Giano watched this shepherd miraculously soar through a pile of acorns, discarding those that were cracked or undersized. And he said when the shepherd got to a hundred, he stopped and went to bed. And he learned that the 53, 55-year-old shepherd had been planting trees on the wild hillside for over three years. At that time, he had planted over 100,000 trees. He went out and just planted 100 a day, 20,000 of which had sprouted, only a one in five success rate. And he expected of those 20,000, only half would live because they would die from disease or animals would eat them. But that didn't discourage him. He kept planting. Gianna says, I returned after World War I and discovered an incredible rehabilitation. There was a variable florist accompanied by a chain reaction in nature. Water flowed in the once empty brooks. The ecology became hospitable. Willows, rushes, meadows, gardens, and flowers all birthed. He said, I returned there after World War II, 20 miles from the line, and this shepherd had continued to plant those trees. Ignoring the war of 1939, just as he did the war of 1914. And the reformation of the land continued. Whole regions glowed with health and prosperity. And he writes this, on the side of the ruins that I had seen in 1930 now stands neat farms. The old streams fed by the rains and the snows that the forest conserves are flowing again. And little by little, the villages have been rebuilt. People from the plains where the land is costly have settled here, bringing youth, motion, and spirit health of adventure. He didn't worry about what the land looked like, saying, boy, this land has a bad past. It's barren. It's infertile. He invested in it. And he didn't worry about whether what I'm investing in in this little spot is going to work or not. I'm just going to keep investing in it. Keep seeking the change. And what God does is that effort we do, little by little, he makes it change. He makes it grow and he makes it into something wonderful. He doesn't let the past determine the future. And that's the greatest thing that God gives us. He doesn't let our past determine our future. He gives us a great future, a wonderful hope that comes through walking with him. See, our calling is to go out there into the field to harvest and plant seeds and water. This is what God wants us to be a part of so that the Ninevites of this world will hear and respond to the good news of Jesus Christ and be transformed. And in them being transformed, our world will be transformed for the better. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you that you call us into the world that you created. But you call us to go in with your eyes, not our eyes. Because we see pain, we see bad decisions, we see anger, we see hatred, we see jealousy. And we shy away from it all. But Lord, give us your eyes so that we might see what you see your children, possibilities, hope, love, joy. Lord, help us to be one that goes into plant seeds, knowing that you will make them grow. Help us to be about your kingdom of inviting people to your love. And Lord, we know we can only do that as we walk closer with you in our own lives. So help us to become better disciples. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen.
Amen. Now, as we prepare to leave, let us reach up and grab God's hand because he's going to walk with you. He's never going to abandon you. And he's going to lead you into a new, wonderful future. So go hand in him. Share his love with the world and be transformed by that love. Amen.